Okay, thank you. Good evening uh, to everybody and welcome to the third in the lecture in the talk series to accompany the exhibition The Sacred Journey at the Eunice Emmer Institute. I'm very glad that everybody's uh, turned up to listen to this very interesting uh, talk on a subject which is the first subject which is uh, the first time we've had somebody talking about a region outside the Middle East in relation to the Hajj. And um, tonight we're very lucky to have um, uh, Dr. Janita Karic um, from the uh, Humboldt University in Berlin to talk to us about um, the experience of the, the Hajj from the Balkans. Um, uh, Dr. Janita is a senior research institute at the Berlin Institute for Islamic Theology at the Humboldt University. And she, her, she's got um, a number of related uh, research interests, including Islamic intellectual history, uh, Hajj and ritual, Hadith, Islam in the Balkans, and gender. And she's written uh, many articles um, and uh, and uh, studies and has also uh, made podcasts about the Hajj. And she's uh, really the ideal person to give us this dimension on a, on a topic which is surprisingly little, little known. Um, so uh, just before I ask uh, Janita to, uh, to start her talk, I'd just like to welcome all the people uh, attending this, and that's uh, those of you on Zoom, but there's also, I know, a number of people listening via YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. And um, if, if after the talk or during the talk you have any ideas of any questions which you'd like to ask, if you just uh, put them in the, in the chat, uh, chat, chat sections of our any of these media, then they'll be relayed and then we can discuss them at the end of Janita's uh, talk. So, um, so I'm very pleased now to introduce Janita and uh, she will tell us, um, uh, I'm sure, a very fascinating historical uh, episode. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Andrew, for this very kind and, and generous uh, introduction. And also I would like to thank the UNISEMRA Institute uh, and Dr. Uh, Mehmet Karakush for a um, kind invitation uh, to be a part of this really wonderful exhibition. And also uh, thanks to uh, Maryam and Yunus who have been uh, very helpful uh, in terms of administrative and technical um, issues. Uh, so thank you all. And I'm very happy to also see a lot of my friends in the audience. Um, I'm really happy to share uh, some of my uh, research with you. Um, I woke up with a slight cold, so uh, I hope my voice won't cut off and uh, that I will, I will also remain um, coherent throughout my talk. Um, so I will um, share my screen now. So uh, when we think about um, Hajj in Bosnia or when we think about the Ottoman um, period, um, Hajj in, uh, Bosnian Hajj in the Ottoman period, we need to think about three things. We need to think about the elements of space, the element of time, and the element of uh, genre. So when we think about space, um, we of course have to keep in mind that Bosnia uh, throughout pretty much uh, a large part of its Ottoman history was on the borderlands, was a, a frontier of, of the Ottoman Empire. And as such, it was um, relatively peripheral or it was perceived as uh, peripheral um, in relation to uh, the core lands of the Ottoman Empire uh, and by extension also the holy places of, of Mecca and Medina. So this um, distance allows us to both uh, observe uh, Islam on the edges um, as the title of one uh, popular podcast would go as well as um, all the creative possibilities that actually appear uh, when we look uh, into the literary, intellectual, uh, religious production in these frontier lands, in these borderlands. And obviously um, the research of Bosnia is not um, the only one which is uh, dealing with uh, the research of, uh, in terms of um, Islam on the edges and the research of the Islam on the edges. 
uh, during the last 10 years, uh, there have been many wonderful studies which were published about different regions uh, of the Muslim world, which could be also uh, seen as um, perceived peripheries of the Muslim world. So there is a really interesting book by Christian Peterson uh, titled Interpreting Islam in China, which uh, looks into these different elements um, and ways in which um, uh, Chinese Muslims have understood the pilgrimage, for example. Um, there is also a book by Nathan Spanaus on preserving Islamic tradition uh, related to uh, Muslim groups, uh, Muslim communities uh, under uh, Russia or in the framework of, of uh, the Russian empire. Um, and also there is a book, uh, Far From Mecca, uh, which um, talks about uh, the Muslim Caribbean. And there are many, many, many um, others, which um, leads me to the second element, which I would like to discuss here um, at this point, which is the element of time. So when we think about um, Hajj in Bosnia, um, it, it is necessary, of course, to think about the processes of Islamization as well. So um, we know that the Ottoman conquest of Bosnia happened in 1463. However, um, the groundwork uh, for the Islamization of Bosnia was actually happened um, slightly earlier through the work of um, itinerant Sufis, um, different Sufi groups, um, which together later with um, Ottoman institutions such as edu uh, educational institutions, work institutions, different types of mobilities which, which were offered to some Ottoman Bosnians, all of these things combined together uh, could actually uh, bring some Ottoman Bosnians closer to uh, uh, Istanbul, uh, Damascus, Cairo, Mecca, Medina, uh, these cities of, of uh, Islamic um, geographies. So um, basically, uh, when we look into uh, the historical documents which talk about uh, the appearance of Hajis on the scene, um, the first mentionings of the first references to the title Haji appear uh, in the 15th century. Um, and then later on uh, throughout uh, the 16th, 17th uh, centuries as well. Uh, so when we look at, into these documents, we can actually see that uh, there were two significant social groups um, of people who, were, who would uh, most often go on Hajj, who most often had the opportunity to go on Hajj. So on the one hand, um, there are people who uh, were, had financial means to go on Hajj, so they had a financial privilege, uh, mostly traders, merchants, um, administrative um, servants of, um, of the empire. Um, at the same time, there were also people who probably had financial privilege, but they also had a um, social privilege, um, such as groups such as, uh, for example, the ulama. So these two groups were most often uh, the groups which could uh, afford to go on Hajj and, and we, which we encounter uh, most in, in the sources. This, of course, doesn't mean that uh, people who did not belong to, to these two groups um, didn't go on Hajj. So there are, of course, sporadic um, references to um, a woman, for example, who carried uh, the title of, of a Hajj. Um, but we, we are not really certain whether she went um, on, a, uh, on, on Hajj physically or whether she, she sent a pedal. Um, so these um, sporadic occurrences do happen. Um, or for example, in the 18th century chronicle of Mullah Mustafa Bashevskia, um, there is a really interesting anecdote uh, about uh, a bunch of young men who were sitting in a, in a coffee house and uh, suddenly um, made a decision to go on Hajj. So there are these sporadic anecdotes that which tell us that Hajj was not reserved only for um, these two distinct um, privileged groups, but still, all in all, um, the those who were rich and those who had a certain um, social privilege uh, were those who, who could actually afford to go on Hajj. Um, so talking about who uh, could go on Hajj um, is, let's say, um, one huge umbrella. But talking about who actually could write about Hajj is um, a much narrower um, uh, category. So people who could write about Hajj uh, were you know, lesser in number. Um, and this leads me to, to the third element, which is the element of the genre. Um, if we look at uh, the writings about Hajj uh, emerging from uh, Bosnia, 
um, or emerging uh, from the authors who, who hailed from Bosnia, we can see that um, uh, we can we could see that uh, mostly uh, the group which could which used to write about the Hajj the most were of course again uh, religious scholars and ulama. So we do have the writings in um, Arabic uh, and in Ottoman Turkish. Um, and these can in a bit can tell us in a bit um, about uh, who were the um, major authors of the Hajj literature in this period. And um, they can also tell us something about the audiences um, to which they were uh, tailored. Um, so basically, um, we can also talk about the genres in a, in a more specific sense. Um, recent research, um, or I would say uh, actually the research on, on Hajj, uh, in some ways has privileged uh, the um, travelogues. And of course, there are very reasonable uh, arguments for that. They're very, um, uh, travelogues are, are um, they, they tell us something about the otherness. Uh, they tell us something about the inner experience of the journey. They tell us something about material circumstances. Um, however, I think that to get a rounded picture on what Hajj actually meant, uh, not only for those who could travel, but also for, to those who could uh, who, who couldn't travel and who who had who wanted to kind of um, maintain a certain emotional attachment to to Mecca and Medina, we we have to look wider. So we have to look into the, uh, for example, religious treatises which talk about Hajj. We have to to look into uh, treatises uh, which tell us something about the virtues of, of the holy cities of Mecca and Medina. So um, to kind of get this round, more rounded picture, we have to go beyond the travelogues and, and look in, into the whole production, which could be um, both textual and, and um, uh, visual in, in that sense. So um, this brings me to, uh, sorry, just one second. Oh, yeah. So this brings me to uh, the three perspectives which um, I want to, to address today. So the first one is the imperial perspective, uh, which um, combined uh, the views on Hajj and the views on Mecca and Medina, which combined this imperial perspective and the eschatological uh, meaning and the value of, of, of the cities and, and the ritual. Um, also, I will talk about the normative perspective. Uh, so uh, how was Hajj presented to um, common Bosnian, uh, Bosnians in terms of, of the ritual and, and its duty uh, and its obligation? And finally, I will also uh, mention the experiential uh, aspect of it. So I will turn to, to the travelogues um, themselves, but I do also want to delineate uh, these two perspectives, the imperial and the normative, because I do think um, they are um, important in order to understand how um, the spiritual attachment to Mecca and Medina was cultivated. So uh, most Muslims, um, both past and present, um, will not be able, unfortunately, to go on Hajj during their lifetimes. But this emotional attachment to Mecca and Medina, the emotional attachment to the ritual um, is still very strong, uh, even among those who ca cannot go uh, on Hajj. So um, in a way, I wanted to understand uh, why um, and how uh, the, these processes um, happened. So um, the imperial perspective. So uh, to, understand, to understand a bit better uh, how Ottoman Bosnians and primarily um, Ottoman Bosnian scholars how they um, engaged in the Hajj discourse, we have to give um, a slightly wider perspective. So um, as you know, the Ottoman conquest of the Arab provinces in 1517, uh, including the Hijaz, um, gave uh, a new impetus to the Hajj and uh, to the related devotional practices. Uh, the Hajj was now organized and patronized by the Ottomans. Um, and uh, in the words of Mir Shafir, it became uh, a central component of the lived religion of many of the Ottoman Empire's inhabitants, uh, Muslim and non-Muslim. Um, and this momentum was um, also evident in the rise of the new literature related to the pilgrimage and the holy places, as well as uh, in the rise of the visual uh, and textual material, uh, which is dedicated to the prophet-centered piety. So all these, um, uh, Develop developments happen uh, around uh, this time. So um, 
this is not to mean that Hajj literature or um, that uh, visual objects did not exist before the Ottomans. Of course they did. Um, so we know about the travelogues by uh, Nasir Khusro. Uh, we know uh, about the travelogues, Hajj travelogues of uh, Ibn Battuta and Ibn Jubair. But what happens now is that um, the Ottomans, uh, in a way, take uh, a bit of um, this um, knowledge which preceded them and in a way shape it or frame it around their own um, imperial um, agenda or, or perspective. Um, so the Ottomans in, in a way were bu building on, on this bricolage of, of different uh, textual elements uh, from the earlier um, centuries. And this is, the, um, this is the precise moment when we encounter uh, one of the earliest treatises on, um, on Mecca. Uh, written by a Bosnian author, Ali Dede al Bosnavi. Um, so, Ali Dede al Bosnavi uh, wrote a treatise on uh, Maqam Ibrahim, where he uh, basically looked into uh, Maqam, into, he looked in, into, into this place as uh, both the place of the universal virtue, something which is ahistorical, atemporal. It, defies the, bound, the boundaries of, um, of any human boundaries. But at the same time, he also stressed uh, the Ottoman um, power over this place. So uh, to say a little bit uh, about Ali Dede, uh, Ali Dede al-Bosnavi was uh, born in Bosnia uh, somewhere in the beginning of uh, the 16th century. Uh, he was educated in Bosnia, but then uh, he also, um, he moved to Istanbul where he received an ijaza to spread uh, the Hawati order. At some point in the 16th century, um, he was studying in Mecca and uh, he was uh, studying the works of Ibn Arabi. Um, and his life and his career in a way um, are parallel to, to uh, or they reflect these transformations which were going on in the uh, Ottoman Empire of the time because um, some, at some point in 1570s, uh, uh, he was sent to, uh, to the modern day, uh, to what is modern day Hungary, um, in order to be um, a sheikh of the turba of, of the turba or the tomb of uh, Sultan Suleiman. So um, he, was, he spent certain time there uh, where he was teaching also uh, on Sufism and um, he was at some point between 1575 and uh, 1598 when he dies, um, he was again recalled to Mecca where he was supposed to oversee and supervise uh, the restoration of uh, the Mecca. So it's when he went to uh, Mecca again uh, is when he uh, wrote this treatise on, on the Mecca Ibrahim. So the treatise on Mecca Ibrahim um, First, uh, Maqam Ibrahim um, is a place which uh, presents um, basically the footsteps of the Prophet Ibrahim and it's considered as believed that the Prophet Ibrahim uh, built Kaaba or started building Kaaba for, uh, by standing for, on that place. Um, so he wrote this treatise um, and he presented the Maqam in two, um, I would say even sharply different ways. So on the one hand, he presented the virtue of the place, uh, which he calls Padl or Padrila, uh, which is something like a universal quality of the place. So the, the place of the Maqam was at the same time the place of the prayer. It was the place where uh, the knowledge of the rites is received. And it was also um, a very important station on the prophetic ziyara. So that is one aspect of the place. Um, the Maqam, however, was not a passive place. So um, in a very interesting um, rendering and interpretation, um, Ali Dede actually imbues the maqam with the ability to sense and feel. So the maqam can feel when someone touches it. The maqam can actually feel when someone comes to visit it. Um, and this is important because uh, the maqam in that sense represents um, in a way an intercessional tool for uh, the believer because it witnesses all these, all these pilgrims who come and, and, and visit uh, the Kaaba. So that is one aspect of the treatise which um, presents us with this universal quality of the place which defies the norms of, of um, uh, human time. 
Um, however, the second very prominent uh, part of the treatise is um, the way um, Ali Dede wraps the um, narrative about the place into the narrative about the Ottomans. So uh, throughout the whole uh, treatise, um, Ali Dede wants to actually promote the cause of the Ottomans and he wants to justify why the Ottomans have the right to rule over uh, Mecca and Medina. And he does it in two ways. Uh, so the first one is to praise the Ottomans um, in their times. So he says in the beginning of, of, of his treatise, he says, may God make their rule eternal until the end of the time and may he prolong their rule concluding with the allegiance to Mahdi in the end of the times. He also does it by praising the ruling Sultan, which in his time was Murad III, uh, whom he calls Mujaddid or uh, the renewer of, of religion. Um, and then he lists here um, a range of uh, titles. So he is the Imam, noble caliph, the servant of the two holy places, uh, the conqueror of two grand Iraqs, the one to whom God has opened the doors known as Demir Kapu and crushed the roots of Shizm in the lands of Iraq. So he's the first who is known as Hakan al Hawakin of descendants of the fighters. May God be pleased with all of them. So what he does here, he is um, enmeshing this millennialist, um, these millennialist overtones, um, which were very prominent in, 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 in this period. Uh, he enmeshes them with um, placing the Ottomans against uh, their enemies, in this case, the Safavids. Um, and he also uh, names them as, um, I mean, he names the Sultan, but by extension, he names the Ottomans as the renewers of religion. So they are those who are Mujaddidin. Um, the second way he uh, praises the Ottomans is uh, by emphasizing how um, significant their service to the holy places is. So what he does is to um, put them in the long line of other uh, Muslim dynasties, uh, which also uh, managed to care about uh, Mecca and Medina, and then it, they managed to um, obtain blessings or obtain karamat, in this case, miracles. So he says, there is no doubt that the noble service to Mecca necessitates miracles, karamat, and enhances conquests for kings. And because of that, some of the grand Abbasid caliphs and others were striving to serve the sacred sanctuary, such as al-Mansur al-Abbasi and al-Mahdi and al-Rashid and others. So through this, we can actually see how um, the relationship between the Ottoman dynasty and those who came before it and the, and the holy place is almost um, reciprocal. So uh, both of them, in a way, uh, according to Ali Dada, need each other. So the holy places uh, need protection and need care, but in the, in the same time, they will enhance the value for uh, the spiritual value for uh, the Ottomans. Um, Ali Dada also tackles uh, the question of uh, female members of the Ottoman dynasty. And um, I will read now the passage and I want you to think about um, who these two figures, uh, which Ali Dada mentions in, in this excerpt uh, actually are. The last one who made the streams flow in the sacred precincts and made from them ponds and fountains for ablution and made pious endowments is the pious wife of Rustem Pasha, a second Rabia al Adawiya. She improved those fountains and spent on them enormous amounts of money. The citizens, the citizens of Mecca live in blessing of her goodness. May God bless her with good in two abodes and may he bestow upon her glory among daughters of kings and good wives. Balqis of the time, who is unique among wives of the kings and notables, also endowed in the name of God. She excelled because of her pious endowments in Mecca the Radiant. Her unique zawiya is at Safa and her kitchen where the meals are prepared for the poor is on the way of uh, Al Mu'alla. 1,000 or more people live of her grace and goodness. This is a unique virtue through which she surpassed kings of the time. And there is no doubt that she is by the grace of God, the queen of all wives of kings and that she is the mother of Ottoman caliphs. May God prolong their rule until the age, uh, until the day of judgment. So I believe you can see that um, he's referring here to um, two um, women. Uh, he's referring to Mihrima, who was the, the daughter of um, Sultan Suleiman. And he's, of course, uh, referring to Huram Sultan, who was his wife. Um, the way he's uh, referring to them is uh, that he um, praises their uh, care of the holy cities. And he also mentions that they are um, 
like uh, Rabi al Dawiya, which is the uh, perhaps the foremost female mystic in, in, in uh, Islamic history. And this is um, something which um, is quite uh, frequent, is quite a frequent motif and, and appears in, in other uh, Hajj um, genres as well. So um, basically in, in this way, we can see how uh, the Ottomans um, used and the Ottoman Bosnians as well uh, used um, two, two different types of discourses. One which uh, in a way praised the universal qualities of one place, but at the same time, uh, they also uh, wanted to boost and bolster uh, this Ottoman um, um, agenda in a way, which tell us something about uh, the quality of Hajj literature to actually um, embed um, different types of um, strands in it, which are not purely um, only spiritual or, or uh, religious. Um, so now to move on to uh, the second perspective. So we might ask ourselves, okay, so what is with, um, with Hajj itself? So how was Hajj presented, promoted to, to common Bosnians? Um, how did they find out about um, the duty uh, itself? Um, Hajj had to be propagated in, in a way. It had to be uh, instilled, um, the, this emotional attachment and uh, had to be instilled in, in some ways. Um, this is when we turn to the 17th century um, exhortatory work by Ahmed Muazin Zada al Mustari, uh, which is called titled the Muharrik al um, or uh, in uh, translation, the mover of the hearts. Uh, so in the 14th, 15th, and the 16th chapter of his uh, collection of sermons, uh, Ahmed Muazin Zada uh, presents uh, the Hajj in, in three ways. So he presents it as God's command, which is uh, something which is incumbent on in every capable uh, Muslim man or uh, a man or a woman. Um, and he, however, he also presents it as a ritual which um, tells us something about the ethical living. So it's not only the duty, it's also something which um, inspires people to live ethically. And also um, he gives um, a, uh, one perspective of Hajj as uh, a way to, uh, in a way, increase one's belonging to a community or uh, Ummat Muhammad, as, as he says. So the treatise, uh, the sermon is written in uh, Arabic. However, it is heavily interpolated with uh, Ottoman Turkish uh, phrases, which uh, makes me think that it was actually meant for, uh, to be, um, a, a tool for um, all for the ulema, which uh, was uh, carrying that message onwards to uh, the common believers uh, in Bosnia. So um, basically, um, what uh, Ahmed Muazin Zadeh does is he combines a range of different types of uh, narratives. So he combines narratives about the Abrahamic origin of the ritual uh, to uh, the uh, narratives about the virtues of the cities of Mecca and Medina. Um, he even um, brings out cautionary tales about people who, who refused or neglected to go on Hajj. Um, and then he also compares uh, those who, ne who neglected to go on Hajj uh, to, um, he, he wants to warn the, the, the pilgrims, he wants to war warn the uh, Bosnian community that those who die without going um, on, on a Hajj are similar to those who die as um, uh, Jewish or, or, or as being Jewish or Christian. So this comparison of being neglectful uh, of one's rights to uh, being Jewish or Christian is actually a common trope, uh, and it's used as um, a certain type of cautionary tale uh, for, for those who, who do not want to go on Hajj or who, who refuse to go on Hajj or who neglect it. So th this is one part of it, uh, where he presents uh, Hajj as a crucial duty, which has to be done. However, that's not the only layer. So there is a second layer of, um, of this sermon, of, of, the, of these collections of sermons, where he actually links uh, Hajj to other duties um, of people, uh, to themselves, to, to the society, to their families. So he sent, he, he he warns against going on a Hajj when uh, people, for example, could not fulfill the duties towards their family. And he even more cautions against going on a Hajj for the wrong purposes. 
So he mentions all kinds of different purposes, uh, which some people might use to, to kind of justify the journey. So he says that people shouldn't go on Hajj if, they, if their major aim is to go um, to trade, or they shouldn't go on Hajj if, they, if, if, the major, um, if the major thing they want to accomplish is the recognition, recognition of others. And they shouldn't go on Hajj if it's only for amusement. Uh, and, he uses the word tafaruj, so he, they, they shouldn't go uh, on hajj if they just want to amuse themselves. Um, so hajj is also placed in, in this um, network of, of other types of duties, ethical duties to oneself and, and to the society. What um, Muharrik al also brings us is the awareness of a relative distance uh, of Bosnia from, uh, let's say, these core lands of, of the Muslim world. Um, so how did these Ottoman Bosnians uh, perceive their, this relative distance of, uh, from Mecca? Um, Muazzin Zadeh brings um, a story about a famous scholar from Khorasan who um, goes to Mecca and circulates the Kaaba. And there he meets um, a very old man. So the old man asks him where he's from and he says he's from Khorasan. And then he asks him, uh, okay, so how long did it take you to, to reach Mecca? And he says, well, a couple of months. And then the old man starts um, to, to shake and he's, he's really shook and he says, well, um, I started off my journey, my hot journey when I was a young man and now here I am, I'm, I'm an old man and this is the first time I'm going to, to, uh, to Mecca. And uh, you should, if the distance between Khorasan and, and, and Mecca is only a few months, then you should uh, go on Hajj every year. So uh, it's not hard to, um, realize that actually uh, what uh, the uh, author did is he indirectly, uh, he indirectly called uh, Bosnian Muslims to go on Hajj because if you re replace Khorasan with Bosnia, you would get roughly the same uh, answer. Um, and basically he wants to, to, to make uh, sure that Bosnians at least think of going on Hajj and perhaps do it even um, at a frequent uh, pace. Um, and he also uh, mentions the, the verse, uh, visit your beloved no matter the distance, even should whales and screens come between you. So this narrative perspective can tell us something about um, how Ottoman Bosnian scholars tried to uh, cultivate uh, the emotional attachment um, of their uh, Bosnian uh, Muslim co-religionists um, and uh, uh, Mecca and Medina. And finally, um, I want to come to the third perspective, which is the experiential perspective. So um, Ottoman Bosnians traveled and they also left some travelogues as well. So um, there are a couple of travelogues from the 17th and the 18th centuries. Uh, there is a number of itineraries uh, which depict to us uh, material necessities uh, which uh, were required of the Hajis or through which, uh, or some hardships through which uh, the Hajis went through. So, um, for, uh, however, um, the earliest known um, Hajj travelogue of, of a Bosnian Muslim is uh, the one by Yusuf Livnyak, who went on Hajj in 1615, and who left a really interesting travelogue, uh, which, uh, tell us, which tells us at the same time, something about the material necessities. Uh, so, the food Hajis needed or, uh, or tasted on their way to Hajj, uh, what type of transportational means they took. Uh, so they traveled by sea and they traveled by land as well. So the, the, the onward journey was, in, uh, was, uh, was uh, by sea and their return journey was by land. Um, however, what is I think even more interesting is how um, Yusuf Livniak's travelogue is actually um, a Ziyara guidebook. Um, and it presents to us places which really mattered to, to Ottoman Bosnians, the places um, about which they, they have read, uh, which they uh, wanted to see. And then they kept checking uh, these um, textual information they, they knew with uh, what they actually uh, saw. And they used to seek uh, places of blessing and places of learning. So they would meet, uh, they, they wanted to go to, to in a way, uh, get both. So they wanted to uh, meet uh, the living ulema, uh, to learn from them, and they also wanted to uh, visit the tombs in order to uh, collect uh, these, these blessings. So, um, for example, Yusuf Livniak and his, 
pilgrims uh, and his uh, fellow pilgrims, they visit Gelibolu and they uh, are eager to, to go and see the tombs of Ahmed Bijan and Muhammad uh, Yazidi Olu, um, the brothers, two brothers uh, who have uh, written uh, uh, two works, Muhammadiya and uh, Anwar al uh, which um, Carlos Grenier, who has published recently a book on, on the Yazidi Olu brothers, uh, even calls these bestsellers of, of the pre-modern uh, Ottoman world. So um, Yusuf Livniak mentions these books. Uh, he says that the brothers were uh, from among Ahlut Tawheed, uh, people of the unity. They were also uh, performers of, of wonders. Um, and then he, it's in a way that he, uh, the way uh, that he presents this knowledge as, um, um, so, so, he so he carries this textual knowledge he sees the places, and then he wants to transmit it and inform it, uh, inform his uh, readers about it. So there is there are multiple processes involved in, in these. Um, so what uh, Yusuf Limnak is, is really trying to do is to go to as many places as he can, to, to collect as many blessings as he can. So he goes to, uh, for example, he goes to Asayid and Afisa Mosque, um, and he, in Cairo, and he uh, mentions how she is actually, um, uh, the place is uh, a place of intercession for uh, enslaved uh, non-Muslims. So that, that's a very interesting fact, which, which he brings out. He also is, um, in a way, uh, he mentions the uh, role of Ahmed al-Badawi, uh, a famous Egyptian saint, where, and he says that his uh, fame has spread through Cairo, Quds, Sham, Kaaba, meaning Mecca, uh, Medina, and, and, and others. Um, basically, most of these places would probably be very foreign to a modern Bosnian pilgrim. Um, so it's really interesting to read those um, pre-modern Ottoman Bosnian travelogues to see how, how this world, uh, how this Hajj journey was um, sometimes quite radically different. Uh, now, uh, what is also interesting to, to say, for example, is that um, Yusuf Livniak claims to, to uh, have visited or, or, to, um, or he mentions Ibn Arabi's uh, tomb in, in Karafa, uh, which is in Cairo, uh, while um, in uh, reality, uh, Ibn Arabi's grave is in uh, Damascus. So he, he does make certain types of, um, um, let's say, slighter mistakes uh, in, in, while trying to kind of present um, all these different uh, places of the Ziarat. Um, now we, we might ask ourselves, um, where was Bosnia in these Ottoman Hajj writings? How do they think of, of, of Bosnia at all? So for Livniak, um, his Rumi identity and his Hanafi identity, identities come to the front. So he's especially um, insistent on uh, stressing this Hanafi identity because he is keen on finding the, the tombs and the graves of the Hanafi uh, scholars. And he even mentions, for example, if he goes and sees uh, some Shafi scholars uh, who had converted to Hanafi Mezheb, he definitely wants to, to, to mention that and put that, um, to, to really emphasize that. However, to, to see a more um, obvious uh, local perspective in a way, we can turn to the 18th century uh, author, Mustafa Mukhlisi, who wrote, who was a Qadi and who was serving in um, uh, what's modern day Greece. Um, and he went on Hajj uh, from Greece. So he didn't go directly from Bosnia. Uh, Mustafa Mohlisi has left this um, travelogue in, in verse. And on almost every second page, he tries to compare what he sees uh, on the way to Hajj and back. He tries to compare it with Bosnia. So this notion of, of Bosnia, becomes really important for uh, this 18th century uh, travel uh, author. So for example, he, uh, right after he started his journey, he says, the water and air of the lands of Bosnia are closely similar to those of Rum, but in the land of, and villages of Rum, both the leaders and the paupers are wealthier than those in Bosnia. So as we can see here, the, the notion of the Rum is um, here different from, from Bosnia, and it, it refers uh, probably to the area around Istanbul. Um, so he, he does make a distinction between those two, and he stresses uh, the, the specificity of Bosnia. 
Um, and he, as he passes through uh, the Arab regions, uh, he says mountainous passages of Bosnia are difficult, but they are not known to be this cumbersome. Um, there are many other instances where he keeps comparing uh, people he sees with, with people in Bosnia. And even when he's in Mecca, and, and I'm sorry, I don't have that verse here, um, but even when he's in Mecca, he, he says how much he longs to be in Bosnia. So there is always this notion of Bosnia, which is in the background of, of this author. And I think he's not, he's probably not the, the only one. So um, in a way of concluding uh, this, um, I think that through this overview of different perspectives through which Bosnians have imagined Hajj, conceived Hajj, or um, tried to kind of uh, transmit it to, to others, what we can see is um, several things. Uh, firstly, Ottoman Bosnian scholars were embedded in these wider networks of learning uh, that informed their understanding of, and perception of Hajj. Moreover, they also uh, managed to participate and add to the prevailing uh, imperial Hajj discourses in the course of the 16th and the 17th centuries. Secondly, um, Hajj had to be explained to the audiences in, in Bosnia too. Uh, so as we could see, uh, the Sufi framework was really important, uh, especially as it brought out the ethical and the inner meanings uh, and dimensions of the pilgrimage. Uh, the awareness of distance and proximity were a constant in, in this regard too. Um, and finally, Bosnians have also left uh, notes about their own journeys. Uh, through them, we can see the common worries and preoccupations uh, about food and drink, but also descriptions of places they considered important for their spiritual life. Um, and as the time progressed, um, so as we move into the late 18th, 19th century and onwards, um, the travelogues will become primary means uh, of conveying ideas about Hajj. Um, the Ottoman Bosnians, in a way, laid out, uh, laid the groundwork uh, through which they showed that they are simultaneously members of the empire. Um, but they were also very much aware of their own locality. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Janita. That was a really very, very interesting uh, talk. It's made me very interested in looking more at the different, um, these different accounts. And I'd like to, I'd like, there's lots I'd like to see. Um, so, um, there's, we've got a number of questions from 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 different people. Um, so um, so we've got a few questions. One, what the first one is: um, Do any of these travelogues give detailed accounts of cultural and social history of regions on the way to Mecca? So, in other words, is there is a is a are any of these Bosnian accounts sort of really describe what's um, the landscapes on, and, and the actual topography on the way to Mecca? Oh, yes, definitely. Definitely. They, they do. Um, so I wouldn't say it's, it's I mean, um, I would kind of question the word detailed. Uh, so it, it, it depends what we what we mean by detailed, but definitely they um, they leave um, notes and, and descriptions of the places and people they see on the way uh, to the Hajj and back. Um, and sometimes they're quite candid about it. So for example, Mustafa Muklisi is quite, um, so he, for example, when he gets um, cheated on the market in, in Damascus, it definitely colors his experience uh, and, and how he sees Arabs in that part. So they, I think that they, um, there is usually this maxim that uh, a haji shouldn't speak about bad, uh, about bad experiences on the journey, but it didn't really work for many pre-modern Muslims. Uh, they were quite candid about it, and they would yeah. say, you know, oh, I, I hate these people. They 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 are not even fine in appearance. They they, they look ugly or something like that. So they really. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just ask a question, just related to that, just because it it was there any any evidence of that? conflict, physical conflict on the on the route between mm -hmm. the Hajis and the local people? Um, not that I remember, uh, but there was definitely, I mean, I'm not really sure whether they would put it in the in the travelogue as well. That that's that's a really interesting yes. question. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. But there was definitely, um, I mean, it really, the, the, you know, we have to kind of remember that the journey was really arduous. And at some, at certain points, uh, you know, Hajis could be killed. Um, Hajis could, could, you know, they, they, they could lose property and like all kinds of things could happen. Um, and it's really interesting that those who decided to write about it, they, um, they were quite candid about it in, in, in such a way that we don't really encounter often in, in many modern writings. Yeah. So, uh, but of course they also left um, detailed okay. descriptions and nice impressions of, of, of people as well. Um, and what I would find really interesting is to yeah. analyze a bit more in depth um, the, way, the way they characterized people. So they, they do um, classify them as, you know, Arabs and Kurds and, you know, they, they, there is this notion of um, ethical difference between between people as well. interesting, yeah. 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 And uh, we've got another question from Sami, uh, who asks how you actually um, developed your interest. What, 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 why did you, what made you decide to focus on Hajj uh, mm. in the bulk, from the Balkans? Because he, as he suggests that it's a very challenging topic and it's connected not only to history but also to faith so it's it's really sort of stretched in many ways uh, it covers a huge amount of different types of things mm -hmm. so basically um i would start from i mean you you obviously have um i think that every researcher has um its own his or her own um private and professional reasons um I would say that I'm, I grew up in, in the Hajj habitus, although I've never been to, to Mecca. And basically you do have, like, I, I believe that most Bosnian Muslims do have this Hajj habitus developed in, in their homes. You know, you have um, paintings of Mecca and Medina in, in your grandparents' house, for example. Um, you, you do have like these different objects. Someone comes from Hajj and brings, uh, brings you a certain souvenir and, um, so it all, it, like all these things kind of make this habitus of Hajj very present in the lives of Bosnian Muslims. What um, in a way really started off my, my, my Hajj journey um, is uh, the way I saw actually, there was a lot of literature which was there around both in the modern times and, and in pre-modern, in pre-modern, pre um, I mean, but, uh, you, you could see a lot of material written on Hajj which couldn't really fit into any kind of category which was required by this modern academ academic world. So you, can't, you couldn't really um, you know, work with it in terms of literary criticism in, in, in this really sharp modern way. Um, and basically lots of people simply did not want to deal with it, uh, with the you know, Hajj travelogues, but also Hajj report, reports on, on Hajj, um, Hajj treatises, um, um, you know all kinds of all kinds of different genres and materials, and I was really interested to see why um, this literature, which is so neglected, um, exists in such huge numbers. And apparently, I mean, obviously, it does uh, talk about certain um, emotional, spiritual, all kind of other attachments to uh, between Bosnian Muslims and and uh, Mecca. So in that way, I really wanted to investigate what binds all these different genres and, and these different materials together and to find a common thread between uh, the pre-modern and the modern. Um, Good, thanks. Yeah, that's, that's very good because that was actually one of the, uh, another question which was, which was asked, but uh, I'll just come on to a question from Eunice Dilber who asks, which or what kind of Hajj routes were there in that time from the territory of Bosnia to Mecca? Because I noticed you referred to, uh, I've forgotten who it was, was it, um, no, it wasn't Ali Dedi, but one of the, one of the uh, I think it's Yusuf Livniak, Livniak. Uh, went went one way and came back another. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, Yusuf Limnyak, Yes. So uh, basically, uh, um, the, the... Um, sorry. Can you can you hear me? I hope. Um, yes, I can yeah. hear you. Oh, yes. yes, yeah. So uh, basically, I can hear you. There were a couple of different. We routes. can hear you. Yeah, good. Fine. There were a couple of different routes. Um, so one of the routes was uh, to come to um, Istanbul and then take um, take 
what one of the authors called uh, a speedy boat or speedy ship um, and go to Alexandria and then onwards to uh, by um, land journey to, to Mecca and Medina. So they did use that option quite a lot because the sea journey would uh, proved to be quicker, uh, they could reach uh, Alexandria in, in, in no time for, for that standard. Um, however, what is really interesting is that uh, in many times they would take the route back uh, via a uh, land route. So they, uh, it seems to me that um, they did want to also um, go to Damascus, for example, um, or Konya. Uh, because they really wanted to see these places of um, which are really important for the Islamic geography, and as, and as I said, they really wanted to collect blessings on the way. So usually, the, the journey would include both um, the sea journey and the land journey as well. So the sea journey in in, in the okay. beginning, yeah. and then the land journey on the back. Okay, that's 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 very good. Thanks. Um, there's another question which is kind of. The other side of that, which is, um, so do you, uh, do you have, have you come across any, any, are you aware of how, looking at from the other side is how other, other pilgrims, uh, maybe from South Asia or from wherever, um, might have perceived the Bosnians in Mecca or, or on the way. So do you have any, mm. do you have any information? I know it's kind of like a different source, but mm -hmm. do you have any, information about how other others other Muslims would have looked at them um yeah that, that's a bit of a difficult question to be honest mm. but I think uh, my um, uh, I think we, we kind of have to go beyond the Hajj literature to look at that and the yes. way I would go uh, the way I would go to that I would try to see the educational networks in the empire and how Bosnians were presented in these educational uh, for example in biographical dictionaries um, I mean, then, of course, we, we kind of have to bear in mind that the biographical dictionaries um, are written in an, in an Ottoman con uh, context, context, but um, you usually encounter uh, the, the word Bosnavi, which um, reveals something of the origin of, uh, of a particular person, for example, who resided in Mecca, uh, who resided in, Medi in Medina. So they did keep their origin um, in a way visible. Um, alternatively, um, they could keep the um, the nisba of Rumi, which means belonging to. It's, it's like a really wide term, so uh, they would uh, sometimes, uh, you know, signify with it uh, even the Balkan uh, Peninsula, people coming mm. from the Balkan Peninsula. So the Rumi would, would also kind of be visible. So yes. I guess they would be seen as a part of that, um, as a part of of, of that. Um, group like coming from that part of the Ottoman world. Okay, thank you. That's good. Um, I've got, got like a very specific question uh, from Suleiman Suleimani, which is, did they ever use the, the sea route from the Adriatic to Alexandria? Is that, yeah. is that a route that was used? They did. They did actually. Um, I think that there is one document in, in, um, in the archives of Dubrovnik, which proves how um, there was a huge group of Hajis which were um, held in a quarantine uh, in Dubrovnik on their way back. Yeah. And I think I've, I've also read about the Venice being a point where from which they would... Um, yeah, very, very interesting, very interesting, yeah. Um, I, just, I just got one, pers one question myself, which, is, um, which uh, relates to the, this. Is, um, so... Um, you, just about the language of the accounts, the language is used. Now you mentioned, um, I think you said that uh, both Turkish and Arabic were used. Do you ever get any other, I mean, from Bosnia, do you get, uh, I suppose, would it be Serbo-Croat? I don't know what uh, the language would have been. It would be Bosnian. Yeah, Serb, yeah. Would, would that, have, Bosnian, was, it, was Bosnian uh, you, you used in any, are there any Bosnian language accounts from this or not really in this period? Mm, not really in this period. I, I haven't encountered any, but um, yeah. Yusuf Livniak, for example, when he wants to describe something, um, like names of the month, or something, he would use um, a local word. Uh, he would use a Bosnian word. So he would say uh, Lipan, uh, which is a word for June. So um, yeah, he does he does use 
you know, he takes a bit um, of, of these Bosnian words and, and he, he puts them down, which um, makes me think that, you know, they were writing for um, their educated peers. I mean, but Ottoman Turkish, you know, it, it was kind of like a common language of the, of the time. So anyone with, with some yes. education would probably yes. have some, some knowledge of it. So they, they were writing for Bosnian audience as well. Okay, well that's 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 very yeah. Okay, so um, I think yeah um, yeah that's that's really interesting, amazing talk and questions. And uh, uh, I think what was interesting as well is how um, the, uh, this relationship between, as you say, the periphery, uh, Bosnia, and through the medium of the Ottoman Empire and the the, the Ottoman language, and this relationship with yet another well sort of peripheral yet central area of Mecca and I think that's a very rich and fascinating subject and yeah and I think um can I just ask you another question sort of like about your research I mean where where do you think um where do you think it will maybe take you on further have you got any idea have you got where where do you think you're gonna do, how are you gonna develop this yeah, so basically, um, yeah, um, well, I mean, the journey with the Bosnian Hajj literature is never, it can never end because people will go yeah. on Hajj. Hopefully after Corona, yeah. they will again start yeah, going yeah. on Hajj with huge numbers. Yeah, they, will yeah. start, they will still write and I do think that I will mm -hmm. deal with, with Bosnian Hajj literature in some capacity um, as long as I, as, as I work. Um, and. Yes. But I think there is uh, another project emerging from this, which I'm currently uh, working, starting to work on, which is um, I'm really interested in um, devotional aspect of it um, and the devotional piety, which is related to Hajj, but also kind of goes um, more into the prophet-centered prophet piety. So from Hajj, I have somehow shifted to uh, more specifically the city of Medina. And then, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking more about the prophetic piety and the ways in which um, this attachment to the prophet has been made um, a constant, uh, and but it also had to be remade constantly throughout the times. So I think it's it's similar as in the case of Hajj. We always um, Muslim scholars always needed to kind of re um, rebuild this attachment to, to Hajj and likewise to, to the prophet as well. Okay. Thank you. Well, yeah, thank you. That's yeah. So hopefully we can see more of your work and in, uh, in the future. So that's, that's really very good. So, um, okay, thank you. Okay, that's, thank you. I think that's it for tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, right, thank you thank very you. much for your invitation. And um, yeah, all the best. Okay. All right. So, um,